Welcome to the Biobalance HealthCast, episodes number 329, uh, discussion of workouts and weight loss that was printed in Scientific American uh, in February of 2017. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at Biobalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. One of the conversations that Kathy and I have regularly is a discussion about research and science and how to understand what people are saying. Uh, when they when they quote scientific articles, and one of the issues that we have with that is that the same issue that we have with uh, publication of news media. If people primarily read headlines and don't read the article and don't read the substantive material in the article, they are often misdirected by the headline. The same is true in sci- scientific research. Scientists will sometimes make a claim to catch your eye, catch your attention, uh, improve their funding, and improve their credibility, what have you. And then when you get down into the research, if you actually look at it, you have to ask yourself some questions about the statistics that they use or that they quote, the references that they cite, the research that they have done. And uh, to prove our point, we want to talk about an article in this month's Scientific American magazine that talks about weight loss and exercise. And they, they foreshadow in their headline that if you exercise all you want to exercise, all you can exercise, there's a limited amount of weight that you can lose, and then that's not going to be enough. You can't do any more. The, the research that we know doesn't support that. And so then we start looking at this article and saying, well, why are they saying this, and what exactly are they saying? And it's a, it's a really interestingly written anthropological study comparing some primitive uh, people in Tanzania and modern Western societies to make a determination about the amount of exercise they do and the caloric consumption that they have and the expenditure of energy. And then they extrapolate from that conclusions about obesity and weight loss and diet. Uh, But then they go a lot of other places, which is really interesting because the other places are where the article really wants to go. Right. I mean, you have to, every time you look at something in the newspaper and you go, oh my gosh, that does not sound like anything I've ever heard of. Or I didn't know that. (laughs) It's counter to everything you've ever observed. Mm-hmm. So when I look at things and at any kind of written study, I say, hmm, does that, does that go along with what I've always observed in my patients right. and myself, or does that go counter to it? And if it goes counter, I look at, why does that happen? Why did they do this study and find the wrong answer or the answer that I've never observed in a patient, which is exercise not leading to weight loss? Because when you exercise, you burn right. calories. Well, it's so and that's that's important to when know. You exercise, you burn it, calories, you, and you're, and that means you can either, if you exercise and lose, as they say, two hundred to four hundred calories a day in terms of of basic total calories. That's what you burn. Then, unless you eat two hundred or four hundred more, you're going to lose fat. So I know that. And now we look at this study and go, who's making the study, and why did they say this, and what's the purpose of the study? Right. And so the purpose of the study, they say, is to, they want to explain the scientific methodology that they use to collect this data. And the, what they use is called the uh, doubly labeled water method. And they say it's the gold standard in energy research to figure out how much energy human beings expend on a daily basis mm-hmm. and the caloric intake they need to have to support that level of energy expenditure. So that's a big mouthful of words that basically says, what goes in comes out, and the mm-hmm. differential is what you did all day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, and and then they seg- and so they they take this primitive group of hunter gatherers who live in Tanzania called the Hazda, and they live with them for months. And they convince them, which is fascinating for me that anthropologists do this. They convince <laughs> these primitive people to drink this special doubly labeled water it has two uh, isotopes put in it, and then they collect the urine of the tribe on a daily basis. And they send it, Airmail Express, frozen packaging, to uh, Boston University where the labs uh, do the, the experiment on it. And they measure the amount of these isotopes that is in the urine. And from that, they can calculate 
the amount of carbon dioxide that you produce all day, and then there's a formula that can tell how much energy you had to expend to create that much of carbon dioxide. So that really sounds interesting, maybe, or not, but what does it prove? And so then they did a comparative study of people in Western culture, same thing, pee in the bottle, uh, collect the isotopes, measure mm -hmm. the energy expenditure, and they discovered that there's only about a 200 calorie difference that uh, is consumed by people that live a quasi-sedentary lifestyle or people that live an active physical lifestyle in, in the midst of Tanzania. And they, they hunt and gather for their food and they struggle for survival every day versus the couch potatoes at home. And they say they really don't find a lot of difference. Uh, and their conclusion then is you should exercise and those cultures that exercise a lot ought to have a differential weight loss. They shouldn't have any fat or obesity issues in their culture. But they don't. And they don't, but then they compare that to the Western cultures where we have obesity issues and fat and weight loss problems, and we're burning the same amount of calories. We're consuming the same amount of calories. The, the difference is an average of 200 calories. Men get between 2,000 and 2,400 calories a day, and women get about 1,900 mm -hmm. to 1,600 calories a day. So they said it doesn't make sense. But it's not apples and oranges. It's not apples and oranges, and that's because the problem. They're looking, they, they only looked for three months uh -huh. at the most. So they were looking at sedentary people. who They measured their caloric um, use when they were sedentary. Then they had them exercise, and, and they measured their caloric use and how much weight they lost. And what they came up with was, they at first, they lost some weight, but then they hit a wall and didn't lose weight anymore. Well, that's only three months. Three months isn't enough to show somebody who weighs 180 pounds and whose ideal weight is 160, and yeah... They're going to lose weight when they eat the same amount, but they exercise more. They will lose weight, but they will continue to lose weight. Uh -huh. It doesn't hit a wall, but they're losing fat. So what happens at the first couple months is, after you've lose, lost water weight and some excessive fat, then you start making muscle, and the muscle weighs more than fat. So basically, you stop losing at such a um, high uh, accelerated rate. Well, and that's an, an issue that you face all the time in hormone replacement therapies is, is the diet and exercise that you use to complement that, to give a mm -hmm. balanced approach, which this research also goes on and says you need to have, mm -hmm. that people get upset because they're losing weight, except they're not losing weight. They're, they're losing, they're losing size. They're losing fat. Their waist size gets smaller, mm -hmm. but they get on the scale and they weigh more. Because they made muscle. But if you continue past three months. Okay. And you keep going, which they never even went past three months in either culture. They didn't do that. They just stopped at three months. They didn't get the real answer. The real answer is after, after a certain period of time, which can be up to nine months, in my, in my patients, that's what I observe, is they will be losing fat, gaining muscle, losing fat, gaining muscle, may not change the scale, which is just gravity, but their size is smaller. They get to the six to 12-month to mark. They have made so much muscle their caloric output is higher at night during the day, so they actually put out more calories than they consume, and then they lose more fat. So they do lose weight when they exercise. It's, to me, it's the same. If you lose or if you exercise 400 uh, calories worth and you eat the same as you always have eaten, then if it's a woman and it's 1,800-calorie diet, then in just in a week, you're going to have lost an entire day like you fasted that day. So you're going to lose that, you're going to lose weight because it's less calories in than out. Right. So that's why I looked at this and went, this doesn't make any sense. The way they're stating it, it doesn't matter if you are a couch potato or not. Maybe you should exercise for your heart, basically is what they say. But it's not going to make a difference in your weight. They're not doctors. They're, they're anthropologists. And they're really looking at how do tribes who are already at ideal weight because they don't have plentiful food, Right. how do they adjust for the days they don't have food? How many Americans don't have food? I mean, maybe, maybe many, but n none in my patient population don't have food and don't have plentiful food. Right. So they have to, they're looking at what do well, but they're the hunter ga to, gatherers do? To a do. large population of 300 million from a study of a couple dozen, right. both in a civilized world and in a primitive world. Right. And they study these people for a few months, and then they extrapolate conclusions that apply to everybody. What they don't take into consideration 
or any other factors like hormone imbalance, general health, uh, illnesses, infections. And they don't measure fat loss. They only measure weight. Only, and they not, only measure energy expenditure. Yeah, that's right. They're not even measuring weight. They're not even measuring the weight of these people, except that they're concluding because you burn the energy, you lose the weight. So, so then, to muddy can, the water even further, they say, well, you know, if this is true globally around the world, we extrapolate out that, that there's not that much caloric differentiation between the civilized societies and the primitive societies. Let's look at similar animals. So they started collecting urine samples from primates in zoos around the world, giving them the doubly labeled water with the two isotopes in it and collecting their urine to see how much energy do the big primates burn a day and what are their calorie counts and how does that compare to human beings. And what they found is that still roughly the same, within about 400 calories a day, we're all sort of constructed to consume that amount of, of food and burn that amount of energy. Then the question starts to get asked, well, then why do cultures like the American society have obesity? Because you don't have that in, in the other places. We eat a lot more than 2,800 calories or 1,800 calories a day. <laughs> and, most of us do, yes. And most of us don't exercise as and, much. And so we're always gaining. Yeah. Not, a, not enough exercise, too much food is, is a bad combination. But it's like a magician doing misdirection because this discussion is interesting to those who are fascinated by the science of anthropology, are curious about the data points of the science they're doing about measuring the isotopes in the urine and what are the math formulas and all that sort of thing, they get to the point they really are looking at, which is if you have an evolutionary change in human beings from primates, in human beings from one part of the world or one time in the world to another, what is the, the cause and effect of that evolutionary change? And over time, human beings have grown larger brains that consume more oxygen and more energy. Like they, mm -hmm. they make a point in the article that out of four breaths that you draw, the oxygen from one of those breaths is required to run your brain. Mm -hmm. So you that's have to have the energy true. and the oxygen mm -hmm. in your brain, and that's diverted from other things then that you could be using that energy for, mm -hmm. which in the primates, mm -hmm. they don't have that issue because their brains aren't that large. Their bodies may be that large but they don't have that diversion. They also make the point that the primitive society, the hunting and gathering society, the men go out and hunt all day, long days, active days, physical days, but rarely have success. I mean, they may get a giraffe or, or a, a monkey or a donkey or something every few days and bring home protein for the tribe. But day in and day out, most of what they eat is what is gathered by the women who gather foods all day, nuts and tubers and grains, and make mm -hmm. them into the staple diet that they eat. Uh, we don't live that way, but they do, and that's mm -hmm. what they do. So the conclusion of the anthropologist is the ev evolutionary change, which is physiological, that led to the larger brains and the larger need for energy and the larger need for oxygen, causes the development mm -hmm. of social infrastructure. You have mm -hmm. a complex pairing of people that work together as a committed group to generate enough food acquisition that the group can survive. And then the more that they get to survive, the more complex their cultures are allowed to become. And so you get a layering effect mm -hmm. of sophistication and advancement that comes from that. So it's a very symbiotic kind of thing that is apparently just serendipity. We don't know why that evolution happened, but they conclude that it did, and that that makes the difference in our culture. And that's why we live in groups, and we live in families, and we live in cities, and we live, we, we all work with groups better. There's more stress on us to work alone and do everything that needs to be done for a family And their argument is that together. was caused by the, the serendipity between the evolutionary change mm -hmm. and the need then to work together to survive. You have to have the team. You can't now, do it by yourself. That's true, but the chicken and the egg comes in. Yeah. How, which, which happened which first? Happens, well, they don't so know. So some people will think we were already made this way. Yeah. We were, we were made this way and didn't evolve. Which we and think some is people, a, we, can, we don't know. We think it's a fascinating discussion and an interesting article, except we think that the article is misdirected to get your attention by using a label that they don't really develop, explain, and talk about. Uh, they know that we're concerned about weight loss. They know that we're concerned about obesity. They know that we're concerned about exercise. You know, scientists will tell you you should never go on a diet. 
that diets don't work. Well, what, what works is a lifestyle change. It's true, but that is true. But yeah. that means a lifestyle with fewer calories and more exercise. Right, so it's so, the balance. And they do the say in the article, mm -hmm. you have to have the balance. You do you think that you can even compare hunter-gatherers who are people who eat a lot at once, a lot of protein at once, and when they can eat get it, yeah. almost nothing in terms of protein and calories. They eat a, more than their 2,800 or 1,800 calories, roughage, yeah. and they're running all the time, so they have lots of exercise. And then some days they're eating very little, mostly fiber, mostly right. getting their other nutrients through plants, right. and then, they, then they, they gorge, and then they kind of starve. That, they have a balance so that that type of lifestyle I don't think can compete compared to ours. I don't think that's, it's not the same type of physiology. You mean where you I can go in and get a bowl of ice cream and consume right, empty you calories feel like. and, and... You can just get food whenever you want. When food is plentiful and we all eat too much and we all have, the plates are too big and we, and we eat way more mm -hmm. than we need and they're just struggling to eat what they need. I don't know that you can compare those two societies in terms of how their calories are used. Well, I mean, for instance, it doesn't make sense. It's not people, apples and apples. When... Primitive societies, nomads and hunter-gatherers, mm -hmm. when food is not plentiful, the women experience amenorrhea. Right, they stop having periods. And they're not periods. able to breed. And so their bodies create a situation where they're not creating babies that are going to be a drain on the energy consumption mm -hmm. of the group. And right. they do that physiologically. They do that automatically. It's not they sit around and have a discussion and vote, let's don't have any more babies. They can't have any more babies because their bodies have adjusted naturally. And then and when there's a food supply that's adequate, their bodies relax and they start to, to be able to cycle again and mm -hmm. to be fertile. That's so, why anorexics stop having periods absolutely. because they don't have enough caloric in, intake. And it's why um, people who are um, doing diets, severe diets, stop right. having periods. And so that can happen in a Western culture where you have the choice options. Mm -hmm. In primitive societies, it only happens when the food supply is not available, and, and you get, right. you know, what they used to call a breeding sink. You know, and, and eventually the mm -hmm. the rats quit producing right, uh, but you know, to they, stabilize their population. They thought that this is why we have so much infertility in America because the stress that of used American to be life, daily of, of daily life driving America, down the Los Angeles freeway, pretty right, stressful. It's just stress, 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 stress all the time. Your cortisol is up. You're stressed all the time. You stop ovulating because your body doesn't know that you're not starving or you're not, your stress isn't from having wild animals at the door. Right. It responds the same way, but it's constant stress. At least stress. four-legged wild animals. Yeah. Well, Two-legged that's ones true. can. Yeah, and then the, there's those kids. So anyway. <laughs> anyway, to conclude, this is an interesting article, but it's interesting for reasons that aren't in the headline, that aren't in the title. And it is a, a misdirection, we think, uh, but it's interesting for us. And it does give us food for thought, even if it doesn't give us food. And I want it to be an example of how you look at an article and you just don't go, oh, there's the headline, oh, you don't need to exercise anymore, see yeah. ya. That's yeah. not what this is really saying, and it's no. not what it should be saying. You have to look at the whole article and go, why did they say that, and where did they get their data? The test itself was good. Yeah. I mean, that test is a good test, and it's reliable. But, but the way they used it is always important. Well, the whole article is on the thin membrane of, of the conflict between what are called the pure scientists and the social scientists. Mm -hmm. Pure scientists like uh, physics or chemistry, or medicine. Or medicine can replicate studies anywhere in the world with the same materials and the same steps, and they mm -hmm. have to follow the scientific method so that that can be done. The social scientists try to do that, and they use data like this uh, acquisition test, this water sampling test, but then they make interpretive conclusions. Mm -hmm. And you can't match one group of people around the world with another and another and another and get consistent replication so that your conclusions are concrete. So you need to be aware of that, too, when you think about what science claims are made. So, thank you for watching. Thanks from Mexico. Yeah. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.